Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Alistway, and I create a variety of inspirational and informational videos you can use and apply to your life. Today's guest is Carly Bushoven, hopefully I said that correctly, um, who is the director of the Madison Holleran Foundation, which was established in 2014 when her sister, Madison Holleran, died by suicide. Carly is passionate about suicide awareness and prevention and shares Madison's story in an effort to inspire others to speak out about mental health and in the stigma. I will be linking her Instagram and foundation below for your reference. Welcome, Carly. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Would you like to add anything else to that bio? No, I think that summed it up. That was pretty good. <laughs> Okay, hey, great. Uh, before we get into it, I wanted to share some uh, statistics that I think uh, just brings light on this topic and how prevalent suicide is. And um, I'm really hoping that um, through today's talk, we can inspire others to uh, get out of the darkness and to talk about this and take the stigma around mental health and suicide talk, uh, basically bring it to the light. Yeah. Um, so according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide rates have increased 33% between 1999 and 2019. So just in a 20 year span, it's gone up one third, which is alarming. Uh, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States for all ages. And it is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 34. Uh, it was responsible for more than 47,500 deaths in 2019, which is about one death every 11 minutes. Suicide rates also vary by race and ethnicity. The highest rates are among American Indian and Alaska Natives and non-Hispanic white populations. Other Americans with higher than average rates of suicide are veterans, people who live in rural areas, and workers in certain industries and occupations like mining and construction. So it's, as you can tell from the statistics, um, it's very prevalent. And I'm hoping that uh, through today's talk, like I said, that we can shed some light on this. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Can you tell us a little bit about your sister and her story? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so Madison is, there's five of us in my family. Um, I'm the oldest and Madison is uh, third in line. So she's directly in the middle. And uh, she was kind of like an easy going middle child, uh, kind of what you would expect. Um, she kind of just was quiet to herself. She didn't really expect a lot of our parents or, you know, um, have a lot of tantrums or anything like that. She was a really easy kid, really easy going, um, but, you know, very shy and quiet and to herself. And as she got older, um, she got involved with sports, um, especially soccer. And she met some of her best friends through soccer and uh, really just found a sport that she loved and was really good at and started to join, um, you know, travel teams and then eventually um, our high school soccer team. And she was getting noticed for it as well. So she, uh, you know, she became an athlete. And I think that really broke her out of that shell that she had. Um, she wasn't just, you know, one of the hollering kids anymore. She really had made a name for herself. Uh, so much so that by the time she was in high school, she was on the cover of newspapers and winning awards kind of left and right, and definitely getting noticed by college recruiters. So, uh, like I said, she played soccer in high school, but to stay in shape in the off season, she decided to run track as well. So she was running track for our high school team. And, um, really just as a way to stay in shape in the off season, it wasn't really cause she was super passionate about it or anything, but she's a natural athlete. And so she started to become really good at track and started to make a name for herself in that sport as well. And so more college recruiters started to come out and look at her for track now, not just soccer. And um, there was definitely some colleges that were interested for soccer, but UPenn ultimately decided to reach out and said that they were really interested in her coming to their school to run track for them. And so she visited and really loved it. And I think she was kind of enamored by the fact that she could be part of an Ivy League school and an Ivy League team. And uh, that's ultimately where she decided to go, even though 
soccer was kind of what, you know, got her into the athletic world and how she um, made friends. And, and that was really her sport that she was kind of known for. They recruited her for track and because they wanted her for that. And it was an Ivy league school. I think she was like, this is my chance. You know, this is what I've worked my whole life for. Um, and put in all this hard work for, so I can go to a school like this and be a collegiate athlete at an Ivy league university. And so she, um, went to UPenn and she was really, truly excited for it. Uh, she couldn't wait to be in college, be on her own, uh, you know, run with all these athletes, be around these people who also had worked so hard, like she did. And, uh, she was truly excited. So she left in August of 2013, Um, and, you know, I think it's important to also say that Madison was never somebody who had suffered from a mental illness before college. She, um, when she was little, she was quiet and shy and kind of introverted, but once she started playing soccer, that really opened her up and she was very outgoing, sweet, kind, smart, beautiful. She was friends with everybody. Uh, she was funny. So, Um, Not to say that you can't be all those things and also suffer from a mental illness, but she just never had. She was kind of had it easy, easy going in life. And um, she went off to college. And when she started to have these these issues, I think it not only was, you know, shocking for her, but really terrifying because she had never experienced anything like this before. And suddenly this world that she had known uh, changed almost in an instant. And she was anxious and that anxiety quickly led to depression and eventually suicidal thoughts and ideation. Um, and, you know, she was, I would say she was mostly honest with my parents that she was suffering somewhat. I don't think that they knew to the extent of what she was really truly suffering. Um, she was coming home, they had her in therapy she had never been formally diagnosed with anything. She was never on any medication. Um, and I think maybe once she had told her therapist that she had at one point, um, had a suicidal thought, uh, but really that was, that was the extent of it. And again, she went to school at the end of, um, or at the end of August of 2013. And all of this just happened so quickly. And, um, you know, my parents had her in therapy, they were trying all the right things. And then she went back to school in um, early January of 2014 to start second semester. And she really didn't even get to start classes before um, she died. So she passed away on January 17th of 2014. She took her own life while away at school. And we were all, I mean, distraught horrified and truly shocked because she was just somebody we always thought would succeed in life. You know, she kind of always had everything going for her. She was so smart. She was so athletic. Uh, she was kind, she had all these friends. So to suffer so much and so quickly, um, really Mm -hmm. was shocking to our family. So, uh, that's kind of her story in a nutshell, but, um, but yeah, so she passed away um, in January of 2014 by suicide. And so in, in less than six months, she kind of had this, uh, this mental illness, this diagnosis, and then, and then she passed away. I'm very sorry that, you know, you guys went through that. Um, that's heartbreaking to hear. Uh, but I think there's a lot of lessons. And I know that's why you're here today on my channel is to kind of share some of these lessons and hope from it. Yeah. And just listening to that story, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one uh, with the therapist, you said that she mentioned suicide ideation with the therapist. Mm-hmm. Did this therapist share that with your family immediately or was that later? So she, um, the therapist had asked my father if he wanted to be involved in the, in the meetings and the therapy sessions. And, uh, he was fine with that as long as it was okay with Madison, but he really wanted Madison to be able to be as honest as possible in therapy. And, uh, he felt like in order for that to happen, he shouldn't be in there. Um, so yes, his, uh, he wasn't in that meeting, but the therapist did tell my dad that she had at one point had a suicidal thought. 
Um, but she did tell him that she had made Madison promise that if she ever had a thought like that again, that she would call somebody, whether it was my parents, her, um, a trusted friend, you know, whoever it was that she wouldn't act on those thoughts and that she would call somebody in our family. And Madison had promised her that she would, she would do so. Um, but that is, that was kind of the extent of it. Wow. Um, and another thing that really stood out to me was how she went from happy teenage life. And the minute she went to college, things changed for her. And she experienced, like you said, a lot of anxiety. And uh, that's across the board. If you look at the research, a lot of college students today compared to previous generations, I mean, it's sixfold, the amount of anxiety and depression that they're experiencing. Um, and so can you speak to a little bit of maybe what was giving her anxiety? Yeah. So I think it's kind of a two-part thing because when she first went away and was coming home every so often or calling us, um, as her family and telling us kind of what she was feeling, um, I personally really thought of it as just like growing pains, like a transitional period in her life. And she was, you know, she, in high school, she was always kind of like the best of the best and she wasn't prideful or anything about that, but it just, everything kind of came easy to her. Any sport she played, she was great at, you know, she got all A's pretty easily. She studied and everything, but like, I don't think she had to work extremely hard to maintain like a 4.0 GPA. Um, so I think when she went to college and she was struggling, my idea of it was, okay, well, she's not the best of the best anymore. She's now in, um, an Ivy league school where she's one of the best, you know, all these kids who go there are the best of the best in high school. So that's mm -hmm. going to take a lot of getting used to, um, so that was really my take on it, especially in the beginning. And I was like, it's just going to be a transition period And you know, she's just going to have to get used to the fact that this is different than high school and it's harder than high school. And there's a million people there that are great at what they do and very smart, just like her. Um, however, you know, that wasn't just the case. I do think that was part of it, um, that there was a lot of pressure on her and she didn't understand that feeling of not being the best at something. She was, um, a perfectionist though. And so if she wasn't getting straight A's and 4.0s and, you know, winning her races every time that was a failure to her. And I remember she got this, she came home over Thanksgiving and she had just taken her finals um, or was studying for finals or, oh, maybe it was midterms around Thanksgiving. And she had just gotten a grade back. And I think it was like a 60 something, 65%. And, you know, in high school, that's kind of devastating. That's a D, but in college they grade on a curve. So I think that that 65% ended up being like a B plus or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that was still so devastating to her. You know, she like couldn't wrap her head around the fact that it wasn't a D that she wasn't failing, that she was still okay getting this grade, that she wasn't going to fail or drop out of this class. So that perfectionism in her, I think was really, really hard for her. Um, and also with the racing, you know, I remember she had a race one time, my mom went to it for UPenn and she, um, ended up coming in like third overall, which was amazing, especially for her team. Um, and, and as a freshman and as a freshman, of course. Yeah. Um, but she had collapsed like as she got over the finish line because she had pushed herself that hard. They ended up having to take her to like the medic and she was fine. She just needed, you know, water and hydration. And I think she had a banana and, and she, she was fine, but she had pushed herself that hard. They were also proud of her for coming in third. And to her, that was still a failure, you know, like if she wasn't first, she might as well have been last. So she was so disappointed in herself at that meet. Um, so yeah, I think it just, it came on so fast too, um, that sh she started with the anxiety. It was a lot of pressure for her, all self-induced pressure too. Um, but you know, she just didn't know how to deal with that. And at the time, social media was kind of new and, um, you know, right. 2014. yeah, yeah. Used to remember what was it like in 2014? I mean, Lord knows it's gotten worse, but right. 2014, it was, it was still rampant. Right. And Instagram was still kind of a new thing. So everyone was kind of getting used to that where 
we've come a long way, I think, since then. Um, we're not perfect by any means as far as social media goes, but um, I do think we tend to recognize the fact now that it is more of a highlight reel for people and not, you know, the truth of their life and everything that's going on behind the scenes. Um, but at the time, we didn't really recognize that, you know, so everyone was posting that they were at college and they were landing these great internships and joining these amazing sororities and making great friends and going to all these amazing parties. And that's all you see, you know, no one's posting a photo being like, I just failed my midterm or um, I came in last in this race or I'm on academic probation. So for Madison, especially, I think that was really hard for her because her phone to her was kind of like a third limb, you know? Um, and so seeing that all of her friends what she thought anyway, was just succeeding and having this amazing college experience, one that she had always really wanted for herself. Um, that was really hard for her. She couldn't really understand why it seemed that everyone else was succeeding and she was not. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of it as well. Um, and a lot of it, I think she held in and didn't express to people because one, she didn't want to be a burden but two, she also just wanted people to think that she was having this great experience just like them. Mm. She put a lot, sounds like she put a lot of pressure on herself to put forward, like you said, that per perfect picture of herself and her life. Yeah. She was kind of always like that too. You know, she was very, um, she always kind of held herself to a high standard. And I, I say this not to, you know, make sure that people don't like give my parents flack or anything, but really it's the truth. Like my parents were not these people who were like, you have to get straight A's and all of you have to be athletes and you have to do your best. And you know, all these strict rules, like they really were pretty laid back parents. Um, they love the fact that we played sports. They loved coming to watch us all and cheer us on, but all of that pressure that Madison kind of put on herself was really self-induced, you know, that was not, our parents doing at all. They were just so happy to see all of us happy, succeeding. Um, and, and like I said, they did love coming to cheer us on at whatever we were playing, but mm -hmm. coming in first or last, you know, really, really wasn't important to them. Yeah. It sounds like she, like you said, put a lot of it on herself. And I think um, you can't always judge a book by its cover, you know, and that's the Madison sounds like she's a perfect example. You just never know what's going on. Even the family. I mean, you guys knew there was warning signs, obviously, because you got her uh, with the therapist mm -hmm. and then um, sent her back off to college. And um, I know we're about to embark on another fall semester and families are about to send their kids off and so forth. What would you recommend or suggest to uh, families? Because there is an impact uh, that, you know, trickles back. So, um, with new kids going off to college, what kind of things would you suggest to family members? Um, I suggest doing your research before you go. Um, and I think it's first and foremost, because I wish that we had done that. Um, you know, we never thought that this would be an issue for us, for Madison, that she would need therapy, that she would have anxiety, depression, um, any of it. And she did. And I wish that we were just more prepared because when it did come time for us to send her back to school, especially second semester, you know, my parents were like, go see a therapist, find somebody you like at school. I'm sure your school offers these services. And, um, she promised us she would. And when she did get back to school, she called, um, the counseling building, uh, at, at UPenn and was told that she would have to wait at least two weeks in order to see a therapist. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there was a long wait time. And for somebody who's really suffering like that, um, two weeks kind of sounds like two years. So I would definitely uh, recommend that parents sit down with their kids, do your research, see what kind of mental health services your school offers. Um, and then also just like, let your kids know that it's okay to take a break. It's okay to come home if you need to, um, you know, my dad was very forthcoming with Madison and the fact that like, if you want to take a semester off or if you want to transfer, that's fine. Um, again, I think Madison as a perfectionist kind of saw that as a failure, but I think it's important to tell your kids that like, you will not disappoint me if you come home or if you need a break, or if, um, you want to transfer, if like, you're not happy, just be honest with us, come home or your family. We'd love to have you here let them know that, you know, it's a possibility because again, like I said, none of this had ever happened to Madison in her 
19 years of life. And then she suffered very quickly and very strongly from anxiety, depression, and a mental illness. And that's possible. It's a big transition in somebody's life to go from, you know, living at home all the time to going away to college. And uh, a lot of people can suffer and they shouldn't have to do that silently. They should have resources and they should also know that their parents are there to support them and their families there to support them. So those would be my biggest points of advice. Those are great. Very good. Um, so she passed away at 18, 19 years, old, 19, mm-hmm. 19 in, uh, early 2014. Yeah. And I can imagine the devastation it was to your family and your community. Can you talk a little bit about the impact of that and kind of what grew out of that, which is the, uh, Madison, uh, Ho- uh Hollerman foundation. Yeah. Um, so not only was it shocking to us as a family, um, it was shocking to everybody, her friends, her friends from home, her college friends, even, um, our entire community. Um, I'll never forget that at her funeral, our dad gave her eulogy and said, you know, if it was up to me, he's like, I would go to heaven right now, make sure that Madison was good. And then I'd come right back here down to this town because our town and our community, um, really, just came with around us at that moment. They were there for us. They supported us. They did anything we really needed at that moment. Um, So they were truly amazing. I think we were all kind of suffering as one. And I think at the time too, it was especially shocking because she was kind of this fixture in our town, in our high school, um, that she kind of had it all, you know? So I think the big thing that everyone took away from this which is positive is that if it can happen to Madison, it can happen to anybody. And I think that's the most important message that I can share with people because no one is safe from a mental illness. You know, it can literally happen to anyone. People thought that Madison was perfect. People thought Madison had it all and she suffered and she eventually died from her mental illness. Um, So I think that's a big part of it. And shortly after she did die, um, my my dad started the Madison Holler and Foundation, and he really just wanted to help kids who, especially, I mean, he, we help everybody. There's no, you know, rules. We we will talk to anyone. We will share Madison's story with anyone, and um, we'll help everyone that we can. But we really did want to focus on um, on young adults. You know, those high schoolers who are making that transition to college, because, like I said before. Um, that was a really hard transition for Madison. And it's a really hard transition, I think, for a lot of young adults, um, going away from home for sometimes the first time for, for these kids. And they need to learn how to not only take care of themselves, but everything around them. And that's just a really hard transition, making new friends, figuring out classes, uh, setting your own schedule, making your own meals. It's a lot. It's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. And then if you were to add anxiety or depression to that, I mean, it's kind of tenfold. So we really try to focus our efforts on those kids who are having to make that transition. We share Madison's story um, and knowledge and resources. Uh, We offer scholarships, but it's really just trying to um, end the stigma Uh, regarding mental illness and depression, because that was another thing that I think was so hard for Madison at the time, was she felt like she really couldn't be honest with a lot of people because she didn't want to be looked at as a failure or as weird or, you know, as somebody who was crazy, Um, which, you know, all of those stigmas are associated with mental illness, even still, even though we've come such a, a long way. So, um, that's really our main mission and what we try to focus on. And we try to just help people and let them know that they're not alone in this. And if they are suffering that, um, they have options, they have resources and yeah, they're not alone. Very good. Very good. And I'll be linking that in the description box below. So people can come check out your foundation. Great. Thank you. Um, Yeah. And I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, social media and the effects. And I, I saw in one of your speeches how you said that social media was the opposite of empathy. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, so I, I think 
I was watching um Brene Brown once on her Netflix special, um, which if you, your listeners aren't familiar with, I highly suggest going to watch because she's truly brilliant and she sits there and kind of takes these simple concepts and just makes them so relatable. And like, sometimes we never think of these things, but um, yeah, it's just, it was truly enlightening. And she said, you know, the opposite of um, depression and the opposite of stigma is empathy. So letting people know that, that even though they're suffering, that they're not alone and being able to empathize with them is the cure for that. And it makes them feel like they aren't crazy, that they aren't weird, that they aren't, there isn't anything wrong with them. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. However, social media, I think can kind of be the anti of that, you know, um, you know, Kate Fagan, who wrote the book, what made Maddie run? She also, wrote an article first for ESPN W magazine, um, focused on Madison and social media. And she coined the phrase, um, these are the highlights. They are not the whole story. And I just think that that's kind of perfect because we need to remember that when we're looking at social media, those are the highlights of somebody's life. They're not their whole story. Um, people can be suffering behind the scenes. They have it's normal to have bad days. It's normal to go through hard times. Um, but again, we don't really post that on social media. It kind of just looks like when you go on that everyone's life is so perfect. And I specialize in this and even I go on and I'm like, Oh, like her life looks so easy. And her kids eat these like organic meals that she makes. (laughs) And, you know, they go hiking every day as a family and they're always smiling. Like I, I can even get wrapped up into it. So I even need to remind myself. So I think it's just important that they, that young adults, um, adults, kids, you know, they're on social media so much. I think it's just important to remember that that is not somebody's whole story. They really are just the highlights of their life and nobody's life is perfect. Um, so even if you're suffering, remember that other people are suffering and yeah, just take social media for what it is at face value. You know, it can be an outlet. It can be a great way to stay in touch with others meet new friends, whatever it might be. Um, like there's definitely positives to it, but it's important to remember the negative aspects it can have on, on our lives and especially our mental health. Yes. And this is another area that I think, you know, when talking about recommendations to parents, to kids that are going off to college, um, to do their research in this area, because if you compare like today's younger generation to previous generations, Mm -hmm. they have obviously higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression, higher rates of body image issues. Um, they have less dating and intimacy than previous generations, um, because they have more screen time, uh, And more screen time has been associated with lower levels of happiness and lower self-esteem. So um, if kids are on these devices, I say kids, teenagers, young adults, (laughs) on these devices for six hours a day, I mean, it's not unheard of. It's it's pretty alarming that their whole life is now behind a screen. Like they would prefer to talk to people behind a screen versus face-to-face in real life. And so- yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, even dating, like you said, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with dating apps, but like, it's just so crazy to me, you know, like when I was dating, I used to have to go out and, and meet people, whether that was at a bar, you know, hiking or at a show, whatever it might be. Now it's almost like people don't know how to do that or they don't want to do that. So it's like, let me see you on a screen first see every little detail about you, about your personality, your hobbies, your likes, your interests, whatever it might be. And then maybe we can meet in person eventually. It's very objectifying in my opinion, the dating apps are, it's not real. Like, and so I think uh, people get lost in them and people are starting to lose some of their communication skills. And then you have younger people who are learning to maybe never develop them in the first place, which is also a big, big issue that comes down to this. Right. I had some other notes on this. Oh, another thing about, just as a fair warning about social media, kind of the darker side of it, because it does have um, brutal honesty, mean humor on there, bullying. Uh, These are all things that people need to be aware of, as well as there are... uh, suicide cults that you can find online and that's pretty dark but you need to know about 
those types of things where people are connecting and talking about and Id idolizing these type of things and encouraging and enabling. Yeah. I mean, that's really scary. I didn't really know about that. Um, that was not something that luckily Madison was a part of, but, um, I, it doesn't surprise me that, that that's happening and that's yeah. out there. So yeah, that's very scary. There's, there's some dark places that may not be aware of that you need to be aware of mm -hmm. and anybody can get on them. A 16 year old can Ooh. get on. So it, it's, it's, it can be alarming. Um, so yeah, social media where we have all this like social ranking and people can see your number of likes and, um, and compare and, uh, it, it's, it can be a horrible rabbit hole. And I think uh, people need to be educated about that and to take a step back and realize social media might be antisocial, not social. Yeah. And, you know, uh, just give your kids the tools beforehand on how to maybe navigate all of that online stuff, including the social media apps. Yeah, definitely. And even like there's, I think they call them influencers now who like make a career out of um, yeah. being on Instagram and having people follow them and they recommend products and, and that can even be, you know, kind of crazy and shady because they'll say like, Oh, like, look at me, I'm so skinny. And it's because I take a teaspoon of whatever product this is every day. And that's right. not true. You know, they're just, they're being paid to push. Hey. product. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's important to look out for stuff like that too, that just because somebody says something on social media doesn't make it true. <laughs> Right, right. There's a lot of false advertising. Yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about suicide prevention um, and ways that we can maybe lessen this suicide number because the numbers are obviously going in the wrong direction. Right? As I mentioned at the opening, how it had gone up 33% from 20 or 1999 to 2019. But mm -hmm. that's crazy. So what has been happening in the last 20 years? Well, Technology does definitely play a role, no doubt, but there are societal cultures and norms that have changed and um, that also can play a role, good or bad. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about suicide prevention. What kind of strategies do you uh, think would be good? Um, so we really focus a lot um, in our foundation on open communication. So we feel like it's important that if you are suffering, if you're feeling like you are anxious or depressed, um, or you are having suicidal thoughts, it's important to find somebody that you can openly communicate those feelings with. And sometimes that's a therapist. Sometimes it's a coach. Sometimes it's a friend or a parent, um, a sibling, whoever that might be. We really focus on the fact that you need to have open communication with somebody and let them know how you're feeling. Um, you know, the statistics show that if you are open with somebody, that that lowers the suicide rate. If you are open with somebody and tell them that you're having suicidal thoughts, that they not only can empathize with you, they can help you and get you pointed in the right direction so that you can start to heal and, um, you know, learn resources on how to live with this mental illness day to day. It doesn't have to define you. Um, so yeah, I think open communication is first and foremost, um, having somebody trusted that you can talk to knowing resources, what's around you. Can I find a therapist? Can I go to counseling? Can I find, sometimes it's associated with grief. Can I find a grief group? Um, you know, I work closely with, um, active minds, uh, and they're a great organization. They're on a lot of college campuses and, um, they're amazing because they're a peer run and peer led group that all can get together and talk about how they're feeling and how they're suffering and how anxiety is, you know, playing a part in their lives or depression. And again, that kind of brings us all back to empathy. And once somebody empathizes with you, it can, it can almost take a weight off of your shoulders. You know, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that is feeling this way. And that is huge. I remember mm -hmm. as a new mom, um, every little thing that my son did, I was like, is this normal? Is this okay? Like, and I would Google stuff. And every time I would find something that was like, oh, like my kid did that, or, you know, this is fine. It just like took such a weight off of my shoulders to know that like, not only is it normal and whatever he was doing was fine, but I'm not the only one going through this. You know, other people are worried. Other people are concerned. And I think that that's a huge help to college students, especially, you know, you feel so alone sometimes when you're away at school and to know that you have these 
peers that are feeling the same way you are and um, may have been in this longer than you and can kind of point you in the right direction and lead you. That is huge for somebody who's going through um, anxiety, depression, and a mental illness. So Mm -hmm. communication, um, finding other people to talk to about this, uh, whether that's, you know, therapy or these peer led groups and, um, you know, empathy. And I think that that's, that's the biggest part of it. So like I said, again, Madison was never, um, officially diagnosed with anything and was never put on medication, but, um, medication can, can save lives sometimes too. So it's just finding what works for you. And just because something didn't work for somebody else doesn't mean it won't work for you and vice versa. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think of mental illness as like physical illness. And while yes, we should associate it with that. Like if I were to break my arm, I would go to the hospital and get a cast. So yes, if you are suffering mentally, you should still go and get help, but it's not a one size fits all kind of solution. When I break my arm, do I get a cast? Yes. Well, if I'm suffering from bipolar, that's very different than suffering from severe anxiety. So what we do to solve those two diseases would be different. Um, So that's just important to remember too. Right. And it's not a weakness. I want people to realize asking for help is a strength and a power. Mm -hmm. It's not a weakness to ask for help. It's not a weakness to get on medication, even if you need it. I mean, life is hard, ups and downs. We go through a bunch of different stuff. And so I think uh, that's removing those stigmas around that. It's, you know, a long time ago, people used to think going to therapy was a weakness. Mm -hmm. That's not a weakness. Um, But another key thing that you mentioned about, you know, uh, reaching out to friends and talking, do it in real life, not online if you can. We we need to connect and re-engage with people face to face in real life. Um, now online, great, has its purpose and has its place, but I think it's much more valuable in in person. Yeah, um, I mean, I totally agree. But also, I think the second to that is like, even if you could FaceTime, I think that's better than like doing anything that's over like a texting or an email, because that a lot of times can be lost in translation. You know. Um, Sometimes you could be like, wow, I feel like that was kind of rude, her response. And it might not have been, it might not have been meant that way at all. But a lot of times, whatever you're texting or emailing doesn't translate into like how you would say it or express it if you were speaking to somebody. So yeah, I completely agree with that. And a lot of times people with suicide thoughts, they feel very alone. You mentioned that a while ago, like you're, I'm the only one going through this. And so I think as far as suicide prevention, it's real important to connect with people in the community um, because once you isolate yourself and you get disconnected from others, um, it can take you to a very dark place. So you have to kind of be mindful of that and to try to engage people and to try to engage your communities and have those connections as part of this um, prevention. Yeah. And another thing I'll mention too is, like you said, life has ups and downs. And I yep. know when you're in one of those bad moments or in one of the down times, that it can seem all consuming and it can seem like you might never get out of it, but we can get out of it and we can move on. And I know I've talked to a lot of people before who have had suicidal thoughts or been at that low, low depressive point in their lives. And they were like, you know, I came out of it and I'm just so happy that I'm still here today because life got better. You know, I was able to find the help that I needed and I was able to get better. My, I was able to help myself and you just, you don't want to regret that, you know, like that. I know in that moment, it can kind of seem like it's all encompassing, but we can get better. We can move on. We can find things to help us cope. And, and you're going to get that up again. You know, it's, it's a balance in life. So like I said, I just, I've talked to so many people before who have been close to suicide or have even attempted it and have survived. And they're just so happy that they're still here today. Right. Right. So in other words, instead of going for a permanent solution to a temporary situation, really think about this. But I have seen that too, where people who have survived their suicide attempt Mm. are so glad that they did. So um, yeah, that's definitely a good one. Yeah. Um, I think another key thing uh, is giving people problem solving skills with regards to suicide prevention during these times, these hard times, how to get through that first year of semester when you know it's going to be rough, maybe you fail a big test, you know, how to get through those humps and, you know, 
So problem solving skills, coping skills, um, those are also part of suicide prevention. Yeah. Um, and I talk a lot about self self care too. And, um, that's again, not a one size fits all kind of thing. You got to find what works for you, but it's so important. Um, whether, you know, it's, uh, vegging out in front of the TV, um, cooking, going for a run, uh, dancing, taking a hot shower, um, yeah. make a list of the thing to go to when you're in those moments to remind yourself. Totally. Yeah, totally. And I think it's just so important. You know, we need to kind of be number one on our list. If, um, uh, if we're not taking care of ourselves, body and mind, you know, what, what is there? So yeah. self-care is so important. Finding what works for us in those moments. So you know what to go to, um, is, is definitely important and vital. And, and I think that's a big one too. So and um, another one is crisis intervention. And it's, you know, when those signs show up and there are signs, because a lot of times people will announce that they're going to be committing suicide or there, there's changes in their sleep habits. There's changes in their social media usage. There's changes in their depression and anxiety level. So there are signs that we know. And um, so we need to have crisis intervention to recognize those signs and to do something about them and not ignore them, which in today's society, it can be easily ignored, I think, because everybody's anxious, depressed, or says offhanded comments, and we're just like, ah, whatever, you know, or we laugh about it. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to, like, a lot of high school students, too, and I, I know that sometimes they've had friends before who have said, like, oh, like, I, I just want to kill myself, or, you know, they say, they talk about suicide, and the friend says, I don't know what to do in that moment, and I'm like, you need to tell somebody, and you need to intervene, because, and they're like, well, what if my friend's mad at me? I'm like, wouldn't you rather have your friend mad at you, but alive instead of, you know, going through with whatever they're saying. So it's so important that you do take, you know, whoever it is that's saying these things seriously. Um, and you do intervene when you need to, because it, it really could be a moment of life or death. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the last thing that I'd like to provide with suicide prevention strategy is, to look at restructuring our online life, in particularly restructuring social media. Um, probably shouldn't be on there six, eight hours a day. There should be like, I don't know, if you're on Facebook more than an hour or two, it shuts off. Like yeah. they can do this, but they don't, you know? Um, and if you look at some of the research and some of the top people that developed some of these social media apps, it, it was sinister. Like they knew it had uh, conditioning effects. They knew oh, that yeah. they, make it addictive, you know, to us. And they had all the different little tools, bells, whistles, alerts to keep our eyeballs on their screen versus yeah. when our eyeballs are on the screen, they're not on our friends. They're not on our family. They're not on our uh, kids. And uh, we need to really restructure that and give our eyeballs, eyeballs to what's important and not yeah. Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah. That's a big part of what I talk about as well is, you know, put the phone away. Um, even if you just start out small, like, okay, every day when I get home from school for an hour, I'm going to put my phone in a drawer. Um, you might the first five, 10 minutes, or even like the whole first day that you do it, you might be like, this is so weird. And you might go trying to look for your phone or being like, Oh, I feel like I'm missing out on something. But as you get more used to it, you're going to enjoy it so much more feel and you're better. Gonna realize, Oh, totally. You're going to feel better mentally. You're probably going to go out and connect with people more on, um, a real life basis. You are going to, you know, get fresh air. You're going to go outside of your house. You're not going to be staring at a screen and I can even get wrapped up in it too. You know, whether it's work or our phones, even if it's not social media, our phones hold like everything for us, alarm yeah. clocks, calendars, um, emails, anything. There's an app for almost anything you could think of. So I could see how hard it is to separate yourself from it, but it's mm -hmm. so important to do so. It's so important to take that break, not just from social media, but from like our phones and our screens entirely, put it away and go do something else. And yeah. I've never spoken to anyone who's made that decision, done it and regretted it, you know? Um, it's kind of like they say with working out, like you've never, you never go work out. And then at the end, you're like, well, that sucked. I really wish I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, getting away from your screens, I feel like it's kind of the yeah. same thing, you know, when you're, when it's done and over with, you're never like, well, that sucked. Right. Um, it's surprisingly, go ahead. It's just a surprising break. I think that we all kind of appreciate and, yeah. and really need. 
Well, the question is, is since we're so conditioned by it now, do we need even more, I don't know, policies from the government, policies on these companies and hold the companies more responsible on, on how they're delivering these platforms? Because they could have delivered it in a different way, but mm -hmm. they did. They chose to deliver it in this very addictive conditioning way. Yeah. Um, and uh, because Mark Zuckerberg gets money, as long as your eyeballs are on the screen, he's, he's making money instead right. of the eyeballs on your wife. And so um, those are things to definitely, uh, maybe we'll just have to see, you know, how far this is going to go and how serious people are about this and how detrimental social media can be. Yeah. I mean, maybe the government should get involved. Maybe there should be tighter restrictions, but until that day or if, and when that does happen, I think that on us. Yeah. It's on us. Yeah. And we kind of have to be um, our own advocates for it. And we kind of have to take it into our own hands and just put, make ourselves a priority, make our mental health a priority and um, really promote our own self-care. Exactly. Very good. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on is suicide prevention resources. There is obviously a 24 hour, seven days a week hotline, the National Suicide Prevention uh, lifeline. And I'll put that number down below in the video for you guys um, so that you can call anytime, any time of the day you need somebody to talk to. It's completely anonymous, um, but that's a real important one. If anybody's in crisis, there is a hotline that you can call and talk to somebody who's trained in suicide prevention and awareness. Um, you have the Hollerman, uh, Madison Hollerman Foundation, another great resource. Uh, any other uh, suicide prevention resources you'd like to throw out there? Um, the AFSP is another great one, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. They do a ton of great work, whether it's for people who are suffering from mental illness, people who um, who have attempted suicide, people who are um, dealing with grief over somebody they've lost to suicide. Um, you know, they're doing the hard government work, they're lobbying and um, trying to find more resources and to help us in our day-to-day -day lives as far as suicide prevention goes. So they're a great re resource to check out. Um, like I said, Active Minds is another great one, especially for uh, teens and young adults. They're in high schools. They're in a lot of colleges all over the country. Um, the Jed Foundation is another one. So they're out there. If you need help, if you want to find somebody, if you um, want to be involved or whatever it might be, there are definitely, um, you know, foundations. There's definitely outlets out there that can help you. Um, we would love to help in any way that we can. You can contact us. Um, but yeah, we, we don't ever want to make you feel alone. You are not alone in this. There are so many people who are suffering um, from mental illnesses and anxiety and depression, and suicidal thoughts, and they live with it every day and you can too. So um, we just want you to live and live your best life. So there's so many outlets out there that can help you. There's so many resources. And um, yeah, if you want to reach out to us in order for us to point you in the right direction or help you find one of those um, we would be more than happy to do so. Um, I even think that that hotline that you mentioned also has a texting option. Yes. So there is something 24 hours a day um, that you can contact. It's a real person and they will help you. And they are somebody that you can talk to. And like you said, it's hundred percent anonymous. No one will ever know. Um, we just, we want you to, to, to keep on going and to keep on living. So yes. All right. Very good. Thank you so much for being on my channel and sharing your story about your sister. I hope that it has inspired others today to kind of lift the veil on mental illness or mental health and uh, to remove that stigma that's around suicide prevention, awareness talk, and yeah. uh, even people who've gone through it as families. I think it's very powerful that you keep sharing and keep doing what you're doing. And your foundation, I'm sure, is going to help a lot of families in, uh, down the road. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for talking about this because it's so important to talk about. The more we talk about it, um, the more you know that there's no stigma associated with it and that we can normalize it and that people yeah. feel like they can you know, be open and honest with their yep. feelings and how they are feeling. So I appreciate you having me today and thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And uh, thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to be alerted when the next video drops. Thanks for watching. Bye.